Gotcha. All right. So then last night, um, where we had left off is we had started talking some unit one. So unit one is the foundations unit. It's big things are models of democracy, declaration of independence, constitution. We get into a couple of early cases, Supreme Court cases as well. But last night where we had ended our discussion is we were talking a little Fed 10 versus uh, Brutus. Um, again, Federalist Papers written in support of the Constitution. Fed 10 is all about factions and how to control factions, right? Madison says that factions are inevitable, that people will be attracted politically to those who share a similar opinion. Um, but destroying factions would be a bad thing because in destroying factions, you would also destroy liberty. And that's not what we want to do. So according to Madison, if any of you remember, how do you, what do you do about factions? What's the solution? We'll start there. Limit their power. Yep. You limit their influence. And so you do that by having a large Republic and having a number of other competing factions. Okay. Um, he says that in a large Republic, any one faction will have a little less influence just because of the fact of the population being larger. Okay. Um, again, a, what are you doing taco? Okay. Um, in Brutus one, why are there hearts on my screen? I don't even know how they got there. That's so weird. Make them go away now. All right. All right. All right. Um, but again, Brutus, the anti-feds, they were concerned about a number of things with the constitution, the necessary and proper clause, the overall strength of the national government, the lack of a bill of rights. Um, a whole variety of things. The fact that the, the anti-feds and Brutus, they wanted the states to have more power. They were very much concerned about the constitution. Um, one of the arguments that Brutus makes is that in a republic, groups would kind of just become more powerful. There'd be an all-powerful group, and that would be bad. Uh, Madison basically responds that by having a large republic, the effects of factions would be limited, and that factions in any uh, uh, model of government, excuse me, are inevitable. Okay, so that's a little little highlight there. Oh, excuse me. Um, so again, we we talked through um both of these. We talked through Fed Ten, Brutus One. Again, be aware of both of those. So we can kind of skip on that. But again, the Federalists overall said the government, the national government specifically needed more power. Right? We're coming out of the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states very much had more power than the national government. It led to a variety of issues. Any of you remember what was the big event under the Articles of Confederation that kind of signaled, hey, we need a change and we need a change now? What's the name of the event? So like Shay's Rebellion or something? Yeah, like but you gotta, say with, you gotta say it with confidence. So yeah, Daniel Shay's and his rebellion. Um, and that's the event that's like, hey, it's time to do something, right? So um, James Madison and some other you know, bright minds, they call for a meeting in Annapolis, Maryland to look at and revise the Art Articles of Federation. Kind of like my 13th birthday party, nobody shows up. So then they say, hey, we're going to meet the next summer in Philadelphia. We want everybody to come. And that next summer in 1787, all of the states except Rhode Island will come to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and they're going to meet to try to revise the Articles of Confederation. Um, as they are meeting, it becomes, you know, basically very obvious to everybody in the room that it would make more sense to go away from the Articles of Confederation and thus, hang on just a second. I'm getting a call and I don't know who it's from. All right, great. All right, so going back, um, going back into this, then um, we had started, we had started, you know, again, continue on with the Constitution, kind of how it comes to be. Why won't you go away? There we go. Um, and we had said that the Articles of Confederation were basically too weak to govern, and so that's kind of how all of this plays out. I mean, when when our founding fathers, when the constitutional framers met in Philadelphia, they're their hope was not to write a constitution. Their hope was to fix the articles. It's just that it became 
very obvious and inevitable that that's what needed to happen. The national government needed to have more power. Okay. So try to make that long story a little bit shorter here. Um, again, Articles of Confederation, then that is our original governing document of the United States. Um, under the Articles of Confederation, the states had more power than the national government. That was done on purpose. Um, our national government was headed by a Congress. That Congress was unicameral. Um, states sent between two and five representatives to represent each state in the Congress. But as a group, each state only got one vote in the National Congress. Um, the Articles of Confederation were very difficult to change. Um, if they decided to amend them, all 13 states had to agree to pass a law. It was like nine of the 13 states had to agree. Does anybody remember under the Articles of Confederation, what very important power did the federal government lack? Taxing? Taxing, yeah. They could not tax. Like that was written into the Articles of Confederation. The national government did not have the power to tax. Again, think of the historical context of this. Um, Articles of Confederation come to be in, uh, it's like 1781, I believe, 1780, 1781, 1780, something along those lines. Um, and that's our first governing document of what becomes the United States. Um, again, context here is that they were scared of a strong national government because of the American Revolution. Revolutionary War, and it was very intentional that the national government was not given the powers to tax and some other very important things. Okay, so think of the context there. Um, again, a confederation is just a type of government in which the states have more power than the national government. So like in the United States, we live in a federal government where we split powers. In a confederation, the states have more powers than the national government. Um <clears throat> The polar opposite type of government in in comparison to a confederation is what you call a unitary government, and that's when the national government has more power than than the states. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, the national government lacked the the ability to to you know end Shays' rebellion because of there was some financial issues as well as war making issues, and so a combination of those things is kind of what led to the downfall of the Articles of Confederation. Again, we think of Shays' Rebellion as being like the one event that kind of signals, hey, it's time to do something else. So keep that in mind. Again, Daniel Shays, former, he was an American Revolutionary War veteran from Massachusetts, goes back to his farm, has no money. There was all kinds of foreclosures going on because so many farmers had been away fighting a war. They could have made their land payments. Daniel Shays doesn't think it's right. Again, the national government had also not paid a lot of soldiers for their service. And so Shea and his farmer farmer friends march around New England, putting an end to these various foreclosure hearings, marching into the courthouses and ending the hearings. Eventually, they try to take an arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. So there's that. Okay. Um, so again, with that, then, there is a call that's put out to meet in Annapolis in the summer of 1786. Nobody shows up, kind of like Mr. Rose's 13th birthday party. Um, Madison and the other states then immediately send out an invitation for the next summer to meet in Philadelphia, summer of 1787, and that becomes the Constitutional Convention. Again, 12 of the 13 states will be represented there. The one state does not show up as Rhode Island. Um, the most, and once it's determined that the articles cannot be fixed, okay, so once that is, once that is determined that a new constitution is needed, and that the national government needs more power, there's a series of disagreements. And you would think that the biggest disagreement is going to come over slavery, which it did not. The Constitution, more or less on purpose, avoids anything having to do with slavery. Again, that's that's not a coincidence. That's, that's very much a purposeful thing. Okay, so... There's a series of compromises then that are made so that this constitution can work. The most important of which I would say is the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise, which sets up the structure of our National Congress. There's two plans that are proposed, right? When we say, okay, our Congress needs more power. There's two plans that are proposed at the Constitutional Convention. You have the Virginia Plan, New Jersey Plan. Anybody remember the differences between the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan? Uh, 
was the Virginia plan the one that uh, had the states represented based on population, and then correct. the New Jersey plan was equal for all states regardless of population? Correct, correct, exactly, spot on. So exactly what Micah said, Virginia plan is proposed by James Mass, and it calls for representation based on state population. New Jersey plan is proposed by William Patterson, calling for equal representation regardless of it. And that's like the most serious argument at the convention is over state representation in Congress. Um, everything else goes pretty smoothly, more or less. Um, but that was the most serious one. That was almost the straw that broke the camel's back. So what becomes known as the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise or the Connecticut Plan is proposed by a gentleman named Roger Sherman. No relation to Richard. And he says, hey, guys, both these plans are they make a lot of sense. Like, like, logically, we understand what each side is saying. How about we combine the plans? We'll create a bicameral Congress. We'll have a House of Representatives based on um, representation based on state populations. We'll have a Senate based on equal representation. And then we'll divide some very important congressional powers between the two. We'll give the House the power to start impeachment. We'll give the Senate the power to confirm presidential nominations and everything will be good. What do you say? And that's, that's more or less what saves the constitution. And from there it goes relatively smoothly. Um, again, slavery is largely un, unaddressed by the constitution, but there's two compromises that you need to know about it. Um, the first is the three fifths compromise. Cause again, the Southern States had an interest in protecting slavery that an interest in laws being passed, protecting the institution of it. It had been around in the Southern states, you know, since the beginning of the colonies. So, so they had an interest in that. And when they hear, okay, House representatives based on state population, you know, the Southern states kind of got a little excited because, well, they have millions of slaves living in the various Southern states, and those slaves are people. So thus they should be able to be counted in population, thus getting more representation for the states in the House. While the Northern states said not so fast. Slaves cannot vote because slaves are viewed as property. Um, they should not count as an entire person. And again, a very sad agreement is made. It's called the Three-Fifths Compromise, which basically states every five enslaved people counts as three white citizens in the state's population for the purpose of representation. Again, it's very sad. It's racist. I'll say it. But that's the compromise that's made to make this all work. The only other thing that's addressed about slavery in the Constitution is the importation clause, um, which more or less says is, 20 years after this constitution is ratified, so like in 18, 1807, is that um, the importation of slaves would be banned in the United States. It would ban the slave trade or bringing in new slaves, I should say, to the United States. Those are the only two things our original constitution, without the amendment, says about slavery. Okay, The next big discussion there is how do we elect the president? Because we're going to have a single executive. And so somebody like Alex Hamilton proposes this idea of the Electoral College that, sure, will allow the states to vote on president, but they're not going to actually be the people that elect the president because they don't know enough to do that. So we're going to create this Electoral College that's going to be the brightest and the best of the minds, and they're going to basically place the votes for the states. Um, and whoever wins the majority of the electoral votes becomes the president. The second place person becomes vice president. And that becomes an issue later, but that's more or less what happens there. Okay. Um, we then get into this idea of um, amendments and federalism and such. You're asked to know Article 5 um, because there is a process included in the Constitution with how to amend or change it. And that's outlined in Article 5. Does anybody remember the silly song for the amendment process? Andy's not here, so he can't sing it for us. What's the silly song? Come on, Micah. I know you're I know you're just tapping your feet there, waiting to bust it out. 
two thirds of both houses, three fourths of both states. That a boy Owen, so musical. Um, yeah, bum 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 bum. Two thirds of both houses, three fourths of all states. Bum 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 bum. So to amend the constitution to change it, you have to have a super majority of Congress, two thirds of both houses, which is hard to get, plus three fourths of all states. So it's this idea of federalism. Again, that's outlined by Article Five. There's a couple of processes through which we can amend it. Um, but oftentimes the process starts in Congress. And then once Congress has voted on an amendment, it is sent back to the state legislatures where they then vote on it. Um, the other method is if three fourths of states call for an amendment and some stuff like that. But I would just know two thirds of both houses, three fourths of all states. And I think you'll be okay there. Um, other questions. Okay. You're asked to know these compromises. So you have to know three of them. We have Connecticut compromise, three-fifths compromise, comp compromise on the importation of slaves, and I would know the Electoral College. It's how we elect our president. Any questions on those things? No, continuing on. So we are going to look at this one. Okay, so this last, um, this will be our last thing for this evening. Um, so this again is looking at federalism, the relationship between the, the states and the national government. And again, there is some ongoing debate about government security. Okay. So like this bullet point here that I'm circling, it alludes to what famous law that was passed after nine 11, the one that I'm circling on my screen right now, what was that law called? The one that gets passed after nine 11, allowed the government to keep tabs on us and what we were saying on the interwebs. Patriot Act. Patriot Act, right? And so, yeah, like what's how balancing, you know, individual rights with security. So what happens there? Um, again, ongoing debate that the government shouldn't just be able to look at our stuff, so to speak, without good reason. Um, government says in this case that security is more important. The Patriot Act has since kind of sort of gone away um, the other one then too is the role of the government in the federal um, role of the federal government in public school education. Again, nothing about education in the Constitution. Um, therefore, it would fall under the Tenth Amendment and something that has historically been managed by the the several states. Um, but over the course of time, the federal government has taken you know a much more active role in public education because a educated population is a benefit for all of society, and so. You know, we have things like the Common Core, we have, you know, some federal guidelines with school lunches, so on and so forth. Um, you know, what should be taught versus what shouldn't be. Um, test scores, no child left behind is another big one tying federal funding to the states on um, standardized testing. And again, that's that's kind of like an ongoing thing. Like, should the federal government have say so in those areas? based on the 10th Amendment, based on the way the Constitution is written. Okay, let's see. Maybe do one more here. All right, we can do this last one here. And then we'll call it good for Unit 1 for, for tonight. There's a few more objectives, but we can save those for next week. All right, so then getting into some other guiding principles. So this is where we had stopped. Um. So separation of powers, checks and balances, the way the Constitution is written, our government powers are divided across three branches, right? Legislative, executive, and judicial branches. That's the idea of separation of powers, so that we divide out our powers across three branches. The other big complementing idea with that, but it's different, is checks and balances. Checks and balances, again, is the idea that each branch has powers that limit the powers of another branch. That's the whole idea behind it. Um, to prevent any one branch from becoming more powerful. The document to know there is Fed 51. Okay. Um, ambition must counter ambition is the phrase to remember. Crab bucket theory. Fed 51. When you think Fed 51, who do you think of? Bob Ross. Bob Ross. Pretty little trees. The pretty little trees, right? The pretty little trees have branches, separate branches of government, right? crab bucket theory if all men were angels no government would be necessary 
But again, ambition must counteract ambition. Our politicians are ambitious people. We have to have something in place to um, protect them from their own ambition, more or less, right? So that we don't have one of the crabs crawling out of the bucket, the crab bucket theory. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, we look at some of these things too, some of the various checks that you're asked to know. Um, impeachment power, right? That starts in the House for wrongdoings. Again, impeachment is not a criminal offense. It's more of a, you know, bring them before the crowd and determine if they did any wrongdoings. Again, we've never had a president removed. We've had three of them impeached, but we've never had a president removed. The only officials ever removed via an impeachment have been federal judges. Um, and again, that's if they abuse their power, or, you know, lie to Congress about having an affair on their wife, you know, whatever it might be. Um, that's what we're looking at there. Okay. Questions on those things, checks and balances, separation of powers, Fed 10, Fed 51, Brutus. Questions, questions, questions. <laughs> 